soil. So at, at the end of this like next half hour, 45 minutes or so, I'm going to ask you to help me. Actually, I'm probably going to ask you several times in the middle of this. So my point of the, as we go into it is first to scare you. Maybe a little bit, not too much. I want to walk that fine line between you know, scaring you and having you run from the room. Uh, and, but getting you interested in soil management, in this particular aspect of soil management, and to get you a little bit scared, a little bit interested enough so that you'll say, oh yeah, I want to participate in these work groups, I want to give my comments, I want to help DEP make a better set of regulation, policy, guidance. Uh, so that's the goal. So if I scare you too much, I, I went too far. Uh, and if you, you leave and you think, ah, oh, I, I don't need to know this, then I didn't go far enough. All right, so first showing my age a little bit. You guys read the real paper in Boston or the, the Boston Phoenix years ago? Used to. Yes, used to. Yeah, well, it's dead now. Uh, but I used to read it for, for this column, particularly the, the straight dope, where people would write in with things. And this was before the internet, so the only way you could get answers to interesting trivia was to like write into the real paper and ask Cecil uh, for the straight dope. And apparently this still lives online, which is great. Uh, and I don't know if you can read this from the back, but it's basically somebody writing in saying, hey, I see curbside signs in front of people's houses saying, clean fill wanted. Now, what exactly is clean fill? And how is it judged to be clean? Why can't people who want to just go out and get some? And is there some other group of people driving around with a van of fill, hoping desperately to be able to sell it some, to someone? And, and really, that question encapsulates uh, everything that we're trying to do or trying to address uh, all in once. Unfortunately, the answer that Cecil gave uh, wasn't as interesting. Uh, and I love it. You know, the question was from Bob Igo, human. All right. So why are we talking about soil? Uh, first, you, you may have noticed and you may think it's a great idea or, or – a good sign that the economy is somewhat recovering, and we have suddenly all of these large development projects are, are underway, and usually they involve some excavation of soil. And since you know you're building these big buildings, they're digging out these large basements. Uh, the soil that used to be in that space has to go somewhere. So on the one hand, there's there's a lot of soil being dug up that needs to go somewhere. So people are asking the question, DEP, where can I put this? What is it and where can I put it? Uh, there are some soils that come from 21E disposal sites, from hazardous waste sites, and that's my program. And that's actually a very small part of this. Most of the soil that's being moved around actually is not coming from our little regulated universe of 21E sites. Uh, but it is a, a piece of that. More importantly, there are a few outlets uh, for, for soil in Massachusetts. So there's a lot of this material is being shipped out of state. Uh, and if you're shipping it out of state, it usually costs uh, quite a bit to do that. So a quiz for you. And it's no fun because you printed out all the handouts, so you know what the quiz is going to say. Uh, this is why I don't like giving my slides beforehand. But if you don't have clear effect cost-effective alternatives for, to put this soil, what's going to happen to it? You know, some people are going to try to follow the rules at any cost. Whatever it costs, they'll do you know, what they think the rules say. And uh, this is particularly true for some of the large developers. Harvard University is the example that always uh, comes up, where they have deep pockets if something goes wrong with the soil, if they put it someplace where something ends up being a problem, who is DEP going to go after to clean it up? Harvard University. Uh, so they are very risk averse in the sense that they know the financial implications for doing something wrong, and they are willing to pay a premium to send this stuff to a secure facility. You know, if they could send it to Fort Knox and have it stay there, they'd probably be happy about that. Uh, they want to avoid uncertain future costs. So they're willing to pay. There are other people that look at the lack of clear cost-effective guidelines and think, huh, well, you know, 
the rules aren't clear. I interpret it to mean this. And they perhaps take some liberties. They exploit the gray areas. Uh, they find a liberal interpretation of the rules, and they're creative about it. There are other people that essentially delegate the problem to somebody else. A lot of contracts will say, you know, excavate the soil, uh, take it off site. Once it leaves my property, it's your problem. Don't tell me about it. You now own that soil. Where it goes, it's not my problem anymore. I've delegated it to you, and I've paid you to do that. Thank you. And there are other people that will, will look at all of this and say, there's an opportunity to make money here. You know, there, there are no clear rules that uh, apply to this. So you know, some people are willing to pay, like the Harvard University example, large sums of money to get rid of the soil. Some of that can come my way. And why ship it to, to Maine when perhaps we can find a spot to put it here and I can pocket the difference? And then all of the above. All of the above is happening right now. So our goal is to change the question and instead of the absence of clear cost-effective rules, we want there to be clear cost-effective rules. People know uh, what they can and cannot do with soil. Things that often happen with soil, this is a, a picture from Indiana. Uh, I try to use local pictures, but this one is just so clear and obvious. Uh, you know, historically, what are we concerned about you know, people doing with soil? Filling wetlands is a good example of what we don't like them to do. Uh, not because of anything in the soil, but because the process of filling wetlands ruins the wetlands. Uh, and you know, we, we have rules about that happening, uh, try to prevent that. Uh, our wetlands program makes a, a pretty penny in fines, uh, taking enforcement actions against people who uh, fill wetlands. Uh, we had a project several years ago uh, looking at um, aerial photographs to identify areas that have been filled by wet, uh, filled, you know, wetland areas that have been filled. Uh, and it doesn't matter what's in the soil, whether it's clean fill or dirty fill. We haven't even got to that point. Just soil itself being used to fill areas of wetlands is problematic. But you can imagine, you know, there are good reasons, well, not good reasons, understandable reasons why this happens. There are people trying to get rid of soil, willing to pay for it. So there are people willing to put it anywhere they can. And there are also people who want to reclaim some of these, these wetlands and make it more productive and more useful. Uh, these are our photographs, but I happen to have taken off of the Buzzard, Buzzards Bay Watershed Association. This is DEP's wetlands program's work using aerial photography. Really cool enforcement program. A little bit closer to home, uh, I was on the Conservation Commission in Melrose for 10 years. Uh, when this large-scale fill project happened, uh, Melrose, just north of Boston, are right by the Middlesex Fells, if you've ever gone into that, that big uh, park area. Uh, interesting landscape, a lot of bedrock outcroppings, uh, sharp hillsides up and down. Uh, this is what it used to look like from the view to Boston uh, from the tower in, at Mount Hood. It's a, a golf course and park. And then one day... I mean, literally, one day, people went up walking their dogs in the park and came across this, which was a clear-cut area of the park. Nobody told them about it. Now, this, this was approved by municipal officials. Uh, interestingly, when I was on the Conservation Commission for 10 years, the only enforcement actions we ever took were against the municipality. Uh, I don't know if that's the way it is you know, across the state. Uh, but it was good intention. You know, this is a case of not really a, you know, a money-driven thing, but it was really good intentions gone awry. Uh, they had this uh, great plan, the mayor and the head of the Parks Department and pretty much nobody else, uh, to, to uh, take in some fill. And where there had been rolling hills with bedrock outcroppings, you know, we could improve that. So there was a clear-cutting. And then large amounts of soil was, were brought in. Amount, large amounts was brought in. Uh, you can, there are hay bales down here. They're really tiny. They're about the width of that, that laser beam right there. So you can tell these are really big 
piles of soil uh, and <coughs> spread out uh, over a large area. And so we were taking enforcement actions because you can imagine what happens with that you know, one good rain, what happens with those soil piles going into that wetland area. And we had isolated land subject to flooding here, another isolated land subject to flooding over there. The wetland area that we just saw was over, would be over by the door over there. <coughs> Uh, it was a big area. So you look at that picture, and what do you see? Okay. Nothing complicated. You know, use your imagination. A ball field. <laughs> a ball field. Yes, you would think that that would be a ball field. <laughs> Which was the goal? You know, good intentions. You're bringing the soil flat in this area, turn it into ball fields. There's a desperate need for ball fields in town. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't think this through. Because this part of the park is accessible by two narrow roads. One, which is the way in which they took the, they brought in the soil, goes by a hard rock quarry and the town's uh, composting activities. Not a way you want to bring in kids to, it, it's really an industrial path uh, with big trucks and it's only one lane. Uh, you wouldn't want to bring kids in for, for soccer or baseball that way. And other one lane road, comes in through the park. And I mentioned it was a golf course. The, the road actually winds through the golf course. And at, at one point, you're, the, the road crosses through a fairway. And it's blind. And, and the tee, it's blind to the tee. And so you could be walking or driving there and get pummeled by, by golf balls. So when all of this came to light, it was finally thought through uh, and had more input, more discussion, and issues were raised, it was finally decided that, you know, this was not really a good idea. Uh, Very little to do with the soil, although the soil was bad because of the wetlands and all of that, but really the whole process was not good. There's a big project which was driven by good intentions, but the details needed to have broader discussion be worked out. Uh, And in this case, it didn't work out very well. But, you know, it's a great flat area. So... Why should you care about the soil? Uh, first, you know, we haven't talked about what's in the soil yet, but whatever's in the soil could get into the water we drink, it could get into the air that we breathe, uh, the soil that people play in. You know, if this, that had been contaminated soil here and it was turned into a park or a you know, playground, you know, what would kids be playing in? Whatever is in that soil. So we want to be careful about that. So, what is soil? It's a mixture of stuff. Uh, a lot of it is, made, is you know, derived from the rock, the underlying bedrock. Um, organic material, leaf, you know, degraded compost leaf material. If you make, if you make soil, manufactured soil, you, know, you can take sand and gravel, you know, bits of gravel, take the, the compost material that you guys were talking about earlier, <laughs> You can mix that up, and you make a soil-like stuff. Uh, but even natural soil, it's rock, it's mineral, it's the organic matter. And then whatever uh, we put into it, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally, that gets into it. Uh, even natural soil, if you, if you actually analyze natural soil, go out and find the cleanest soil that you could possibly imagine, and you take it to a laboratory, and you ask them to analyze it, You're going to find lead. You're going to get measurable levels of nickel. They'll tell you exactly how much chromium is there, and there will be chromium in it. If you measure uh, soil for what we would call oil or hazardous materials in in my business, then you will find oil or hazardous materials. You'll find metals. You'll find organic chemicals because it's made up of something. So when you talk about clean fill, let's go back to the, the, the straight dope question, what is clean fill? Ideally, and you know, when we talk with the public, or when the public talks at me, probably is the better way to describe it, you know, people want soil that has nothing in it. And I can't give them that. There is no such thing as soil that has zero concentration of hazardous materials because that's what it's made out of. So the question that we have to face, and that we really need to answer, which has not been addressed by anybody, is what is clean enough? What is clean fill? 
you know, we can't, when I was on the CONCOM, we wrote a lot of orders of conditions telling people that we're going to bring in Phil, you know, to build a house, and it's close enough to wetland that we were, uh, we were overseeing it. So we're right in the order of conditions. Yeah, if you're going to bring in fill material, it has to be clean fill. And, you know, I should have known better. You know, I'm a chemist. I work for DEP. But, you know, that's what we wrote. Uh, and how do you tell? And you guys probably do the same thing, or your concoms do the same thing. Uh, the municipalities will contract, you know, when building a new school, building playgrounds, ball fields, that sort of thing. They, they contract out that work. They tell the contractors, oh, if you're going to bring in fill, you need to bring in clean fill. What does it mean? Right now, we really don't have any established guidelines for that. We don't have any standards. So it's a crapshoot. Uh, the city of New Bedford um, resurfaced, uh, rehabilitated, that's the word, rehabilitated uh, ball fields down there at one point and you know, had contracted out, you know, bring clean fill. They brought in clean fill. You know, 15 years later, we were out there sampling for a completely unrelated thing, uh, and, but they sampled the ball field and found high levels of arsenic and lead in the infield. You know, kids have been playing there for 15 years uh, in the material. They said it was clean, but there had been no established guidelines. Nobody asked for the, the data. Nobody asked for it to be analyzed. Uh, so what we want to do is partly a, a paradigm shift, if I can use that term, uh, and... <laughs> Regardless of where soil comes from, if you're talking about soil being brought in uh, for whatever reason, you know, we want people to stop and think, well, what's in it? What are the concentrations? Uh, you know, is it safe? Is it appropriate for the use that I'm going to put it to, uh, how I'm going to use it? Uh, so that, that's the overall objective. Even if it's for things that aren't strictly regulated in the, the realm of what we do, if we do it right, then it will get more people to ask the question and we'll stop using the term clean fill and use something else. Personally, I like the term reclamation soil, but we'll get to that. So we have soil out there that is consistent with natural background. Woohoo! We like that, right? Except unless it's from some parts of this region where natural background could have very high levels of arsenic in it. And then, you know, maybe natural background doesn't sound so great. Uh, the soil that comes from uh, contaminated sites or waste sites, which must be disposed of or recycled appropriately, you know, that's the stuff that we really think of as contaminated material, contaminated soil. Most of the stuff that we're going to see is somewhere in between. It's not contaminated material, but it has measurable levels of oil hazardous material. That's our term of art, or stuff, chemicals in it. And we really need to have something better than it has to be clean. It has, you have to have nothing in it. Uh, we have to have a better answer for that. We have to have, have chemicals and concentrations to be able to say, you know, if it meets these criteria, then you can use it in a playground. If it meets those criteria, you can uh, use it as a uh, road base. If it meets that criteria, you can use it underneath uh, the parking lot at Target. That sort of thing. So for today's <coughs> discussion, you know, this stuff, the hazardous, which contaminated stuff, you know, we're just going to get rid of that. Because if it's contaminated, and we, can, we have a good idea of how to define contaminated, we're just going to take it off the table. You can't, you know, it has to be disposed of or recycled appropriately. Uh, it not reuses anything even approximating clean fill. So we are not talking about hazardous waste. Period. If it's hazardous waste, it's off the table. You can't do anything with it. Well, you have to dispose of it or recycle it appropriately, treat it, that sort of thing. But if it's hazardous waste, don't come to me saying it's an approximation of clean fill. If it's remediation waste, which under the 21E program is stuff that's above reportable concentrations, it's stuff that could pose a risk under some circumstances, you know, it's being clean. That's the stuff we are cleaning up. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. COM 97 soil. Anybody know what COM 97 soil is? Mary, you don't count. Anybody else who doesn't work for DEV? Uh, COM 97 is the term. It's a policy from 1997. One of our better policies, I have to say, uh, that uh, for the solid waste program talks about what kinds of soils and it gives concentrations you know, up to 
soils containing up to these amounts can be used at landfills, a restricted environment, low exposures, as daily cover to keep down the trash, make sure it doesn't blow around, that sort of thing, or uh, as grading and shaping material when you're actually closing the landfill, all of which ends up underneath the final cap. So they have th these are soils that, because of its limited use, uh, can have safely have higher levels of oil hazardous material in it. We're not talking about that. That's not what we would call an approximation of clean fill. If it's that kind of soil, then it's appropriate to go, you know, be reused as daily cover or grading and shaping material at landfills. Great use for it. Uh, don't come and talk to me about it. And it's not solid waste. We're not using solid waste as filled material. Uh, now, some of the soil that we, we could consider kind of cleanish fill uh, might be coming from some of my sites. Because if you have a 21E site, you have a has waste site, it doesn't mean that everything there is contaminated. And there's uh, good reason to sample the soil and segregate out, identify those areas that you have hot spots, you have higher concentrations, and move them off appropriately. But you may end up with some soil that still has to be removed that has lower concentrations. And there, there are good reasons, including economic reasons, for doing the sampling in order to segregate, segregate those piles. And then you might, you might still have some soil from a 21E site that is essentially not contaminated, but it's coming from our site. We do regulate those right now, uh, and there are policies dealing with that. Uh, but as I said before, that's a small part of the universe of soil that's being moved out there that we want to talk about. So right now, there's some soil that's been going to landfills for daily cover or grading and shaping. Some soil that's being sent to quarries and sand pits and gravel pits uh, to fill. Uh, there are some examples of farms taking in soil to supposedly to level the areas to increase uh, you know, the areas where they can grow crops. There are you know, development sites often need uh, soil. They may be cutting out some soil, taking some away, but they need other, they need more soil for, for different areas. Uh, and then there are borrow pit stockpiles that exist around. And there's a lot being sent out of state as well. So even without the question of contamination, uh, neighbors, you know, they're concerned about contamination, they're concerned about dust in general, they're concerned about noise, sloppy spill, fill projects, even without contamination can be problematic, can cause problems if it you know, goes into wetland, that sort of thing. And you have leaching and runoff concerns. So even with non-contaminated soil, you want to make sure that large fill projects don't create problems. From our perspective, first, we want to make sure that we want to do everything that we can, either directly through regulation or by setting up a system where people start asking for it, even if it's not regulated. We want people to sample soil. The soil is being moved. We want people to know what's in it so that people are making informed decisions about whether that soil is good for this use. And I think through an education process, through setting up even you know, in one narrow area of regulation, if we set up a, a scheme by which soil is graded, it's clear that soil with certain concentrations is good for certain uses, then other people, even in areas that are not regulated, will start asking for this soil, asking for that uh, analysis so that they'll know. Uh, one example of that is DCAM, the Department of Capital, A Capital Asset Management. You know who DCAM is? They're like the state's real estate arm. They're the ones who actually own the state property or manage the state property. Uh, they do a lot of building. They do a lot of construction. They contract for a lot of soil. So does DOT as well. They are eager to have standards and rules in place. Even if it doesn't strictly apply to them, because they want to cite concentrations and standards in their bid documents so that they are asking contractors, if you're going to use soil, you know, they'll scrap the language that says use clean fill. They'll put in, you need to meet, bring soil, use soil that meets these criteria that DEP has published, even if our rules don't strictly apply to them. If we put out a list of numbers, people always use them for a variety of reasons. This would be a good thing to kind of expand their influence. Uh, we don't want to create new 21E sites, new hazardous waste sites. 
And we don't want to create new dumping grounds as well. We want this soil to be reused, recycled, put to beneficial use, not just dumped somewhere. So what we've done so far has really been first on a case-by-case basis, uh, issuing uh, approvals for projects that have come before us. You know, there are landfill projects for the grading and shaping and that sort of thing. Uh, for the 21E soils, we issued a similar soils policy. I think you heard about that last year, so we won't talk about that too much. But that's strictly for soil coming from 21E sites, small universe. Uh, we've, been, oops, we've been using site-specific approvals. And the, the thing is that the existing authorities for regulating soil, for DEP to regulate soil, is, like I said before, it's not clear. Kind of a lot of gray areas. Uh, we have to kind of pick and choose our authorities. So we're, we're taking very tentative steps in doing this, being very cautious about it. Uh, and then, and then last year, as part of the state budget, uh, the legislature passed uh, an amendment to the budget, Section 277 of FY15 budget, uh, that changed everything for us, at least, at least for this program. And so can you read this? I'm going to take a little, a few minutes. No. Uh, these are the big words. <laughs> these are the important words. That, that, that whole kind of gray paragraph, it really boils down to this. That really, too soon, June 30th, 2015, DEP has to have regulations, guidelines, standards, or practices. That's an or, which gives us a little bit of flexibility, which is our only hope of meeting the June 30th deadline. Uh, of identifying criteria to determine the suitability of soil, so establishing the standards for soil, are for its use to reclaim quarries, sand pits, and gravel pits. We have to make sure that that soil, when you use it to fill those holes, that it poses no significant risk, and that's a term of art that we use in our 21E program, so we know what no significant risk means. We know how to evaluate that. And we have to look at the transport of the soil. We have to look at the operations of the facility. We have to look at the foreseeable future uses of that property after they're done filling the hole. All of that has to go into the no significant risk. We have to make sure that there's, there's no risk in all of those aspects from the beginning to the end of the project. DEP has been told that we have to decide, we have to determine which activities or projects require a permit before they can actually do it. Conversely, we can decide that there are some activities, some projects that don't need a permit and they can go on and, and use, the soil, use soil to fill uh, holes without a permit. Uh, and this is, this is where you guys come in at the last one. The legislation said that their DEP shall determine that the categories of activities or, or uh, projects that require local approval. Frankly, we're not quite sure what that means. Uh, it, it did say that projects under 100,000 cubic yards don't require local approval. So starting at 100,000 cubic yards per project, some kind of local approval, unspecified by law, uh, may or may not be required as determined by DDP. So that's kind of the unclear direction that we've been given. And we've, we've been meeting with uh, Mass Municipal Association. We've been meeting with uh, a variety of uh, different groups of municipal officials. You guys are on the list. You're, that's why, one of the reasons why I'm here, like I said, to, to scare you a little bit and excite you a little bit and get you involved. Because we want to figure out what it means by local approval in a way that will work for all of the cities and towns in Massachusetts, uh, in a way that will give constructive input to these projects so that, you know, if going back to my example in Melrose, all that was done by you know, municipal officials who didn't talk to anybody. So there are issues that came up that should have been really clear and obvious if only they talked about it beforehand. And people, both the, within city government and the people that lived around or used the park, if people had a, had a chance to get involved and express their concerns and raise the issues, these would have come up. 
So that kind of discussion, that kind of uh, raising of issues and addressing issues is important. So we want to build that into this process in a way that will work for everybody. So we don't know how to do that yet. And that's where we're going to need your input, your help, to try to figure that out. So we're looking to develop regulations for, for this, uh, plus some uh, guidelines and standards and all of that, are uh, looking at concentrations of, of chemicals, the constituents of soil. There's no good word for it, you know, because I, I use oil and hazardous material because that's the term my program uses. You know, chemicals, eh, it doesn't sound quite right. But it's the constituents of soil, you know, the standards, the chemical standards uh, to determine, you know, what's right for what kind of uses. Uh, we're, we're reusing the soil to fill holes, similar to uh, the Quincy quarries uh, in Quincy. Uh, we used a lot of soil there to, to fill what had been safety risks. Uh, a number of people had died jumping into the quarries. Uh, a num- there were rumors that a number of people had died outside the quarries and then been brought to the quarries. Uh, uh, there, are, there are a lot of cars that somehow inadvertently drove into the quarries. Uh, they were safety risks. They now, uh, that area is a DCR park uh, that is, I'm told, one of the, the best rock climbing locations in, in eastern Massachusetts. You know, it's a great resource. It went from being an eyesore and a safety risk to a, a beautiful park. Uh, there are other quarries and sand pits and gravel pits that you know, can be repurposed, whether it's for a new park, whether it's for ball fields, whether it's for uh, a, a new Walmart. It's not for us, DEP, to decide. Uh, but at some point, these, you know, these holes in the ground, when filled, can serve a better, hopefully better, purpose. And that's, you know, that's how we try to distinguish between reuse uh, you know, having a specific redevelopment project or reclamation project uh, that has local community kind of knowledge, discussion, and acceptance. It's never going to be 100% acceptance, but we want to have, make sure that the discussion and occurs and that whatever project goes forward addresses all of the issues that come up. Disposal, on the other hand, if you're looking at this, if people are trying to dispose of soil, you know, this is not a good idea. You know, it's, it's really getting back to the definition of disposal. It's dumping landfill replacement onto land or water of useless, unwanted material. And one of the things that we look at in trying to determine whether it's reuse or disposal is that community acceptance, the community discussion, the, the local approval that will go into it. Uh, all of these are probably good reasons for why local approval is important. Uh, the large soil volumes you know, can be mismanaged even without contamination. It's a problem. We want to make sure all the uh, issues are addressed and that the, the projects as they're t- being discussed are real and viable projects. The large soil volumes me- could mean mismanagement and c- could create significant problems, include you know, the potential for runoff. We want to make sure that that's addressed uh, and leaching to underlying water bodies. Um, there's the dust, there's the contact with the soil, all of those risk-related things we want to make sure are addressed properly. So, recap, we're not talking about contaminated soil. Uh, we have a lot of experience moving soil uh, that we want to bring to bear to these projects. Uh, and the, the projects in and of themselves could be useful and beneficial and change safety hazards into productive parks and that sort of thing. So that's overall what we're trying to do. We have not worked out how we're going to do this yet, which is why I'm here to try to convince you to participate uh, and to give us your ideas and to tell us, particularly help us with the local approval part, but also all of the other aspects of it. You know, I, I don't want to you know, box you into that one little role. Uh, our initial thoughts on this is that there would be some kind of permit that DEP would issue, and we have the authority to that under Section 277. Uh, and we divide the world up less sensitive locations and more sensitive locations. Uh, on the left-hand side, these are different, you know, increasing concentrations of uh, chemicals in soil, but still, even the highest concentrations here, I would reinforce that we're not talking about contaminated soil. Even these high levels are, would not be considered contaminated soil. 
So on the more sensitive locations, we would generally look at that uh, kind of a simple way of describing it would be if there are kids that are going to be there or live, work, go to school in the area, if it's close to a school, close to a playground, close to a recreational area, then it's a sensitive location. Uh, conversely, the less sensitive location would be a place distant from kids. Also, another thing we consider in sensitive locations is uh, threats to, to drinking water supplies, not just public water supplies, but also private water supplies, you know, private wells. So we would consider any place that is in a zone one or zone two, an interim wellhead protection area, a zone A of a class A surface water body, uh, or within 500 feet of a private well, those would be considered um, areas to be protected for current drinking water use. But we also look at future drinking water use. because Just because there's not a private well there now, uh, if it's distant from a drinking uh, a distribution line, a water supply distribution line, where where is somebody that's going to develop that property get their water? They're going to put a well in. So we have criteria that if you're you're distant from a distribution line, more than 500 feet, it needs to be protected for future drinking water use, potentially productive aquifer, uh, aquifers, potential future drinking water source. Uh, if the you have a local aquifer protection district. Uh, we'll take that into account. That's being protected for future drinking water sources. So those would be the areas that would be uh, more sensitive locations. And then you can imagine if you have this six-block grid uh, that whatever's in the upper right-hand corner, which is the relatively higher but still not contaminated concentrations in soil, in a more sensitive location would require, we think, more oversight. You know, that's where you want to be careful. You want, you want to make sure that they're going to bring the relatively higher but still not, uncontaminated, uh, still not contaminated soil to a more sensitive location than they can do it, but you know, we'll be watching you very intently. So we would give them this type, a type A permit that would have all the bells and whistles still to be determined, mind you. This is very generic. Uh, and then as you go down to the you know, lowest concentrations in the less sensitive locations, less oversight would be required for that. They would still need to have oversight. There would still have to be a way to hold people accountable because we want to make sure that, in fact, the soil that they're bringing there is meeting those standards and not anything higher than that. We don't want a, a perceived lack of oversight to be taken as free reign to bring anything they want there. So there would still be people being held accountable. There would still be uh, sampling required. There would still be reports submitted. There would still be uh, potential for uh, audit and inspections to make sure that, in fact, this is what's going on. But assuming everything is going correctly, anything down in this area would have less, fewer bells, fewer whistles. So you could imagine, potentially, and I don't know how this is going to work out, uh, this is probably the, the worst case condition where we'd have multiple types of permits uh, and depending upon you know, how, whether you're in the upper right-hand corner or the lower left-hand corner, and some sort of conditional exemption, which you don't need a permit, but you still need to meet the performance standards. Uh, now, whether it works out like this, I don't know. We'll have those discussions hopefully this spring. And within this, you'll see there are these green areas. You can't read them, but you can probably see them. Uh, are small volumes, or, you know, de minimis volumes. Even up here, you need a type B permit unless you're talking really small volumes of soil. Because we don't want to be in the business of regulating every fill product. You know, if it's small volumes of soil, what's small? I don't know yet. Um, it would be a conditional exemption until down here. You know, the whole block would be conditional exemption. So that's the general schema. Uh, but all the details are what becomes important, and that's where you could participate. And what does the RSD stand for? Well, yeah, the, the, uh, that would stand for, right now would stand for reclamation soil. So what I'm envisioning are different grades. Reclamation soil zero, reclamation soil one, reclamation soil two. So they're uh, giving it a name makes it a little bit more real. 
And from a bidding perspective, you know, DCAB would be able to say, you know, for this project, you can bring in reclamation soil two, category two. So the concentrations you know, get to be assigned, but that sort of thing. And you can imagine that even if you're in uh, a less less sensitive location, you can bring in the higher concentrations. The colors don't come out quite as well here. But we're also giving thought to, in those situations, even the relatively higher but still not contaminated soil, uh, maybe that should go on the bottom. And so that partly to take into account potential future uses to make sure that it doesn't pose a risk, uh, have the cleaner stuff uh, be on the top, and whether it's 3 feet or 15 feet of cl you know, the cleanest material to finish off the project, you know, we'll see. that Those are the details. But conceptually, I think we'd want... Uh, you know, the material on the top certainly be consistent with like residential use so that no matter what happens with the, the property, how it gets transferred into the future, that it would impose a risk. And one thing that this is kind of a footnote here in the notes, but uh, it's probably worth mentioning that in all of this stuff, you know, generally we're talking about the metals that are typically naturally occurring, and but maybe more or less high levels. Things like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are all over the place and very common. Um, what we don't want to include in this, and this is part of the, you know, it's not contaminated soil. I don't care what the concentrations are. No PCBs. Period. Uh, no volatile organic compounds. Period. You know? Even if they're really low concentrations, I mean, we probably have to establish some very low de minimis levels, but you know, if just don't bring it here. Don't bring it to these projects. It's not acceptable for that. So we would have approvals. We'd have submittals uh, online. You know, ideally, we'd have all this stuff be submitted online. It would be available for you guys, to, you guys and everybody else in the world uh, to look at, to see what soil is coming to this project that's in my backyard. You can look at the concentrations. You can look at who's doing it. You can see what the schedule is, all of that. Um, uh, so the question is ponder. Uh, what kind of soils will go to what kind of projects? Um, how do you have confidence that the soil uh, that's coming in on the trucks actually is what people say it is? So you know, how can you have confidence in the sampling? You know, what's the structure of the formatting and the reporting to give you that confidence? And again, getting back to something you know, more directly at you, what kind of local input approval is appropriate for all of this? So that's what we're working towards. As I said, the Section 277 of the budget gave us until June 30th of 2015. Uh, we're also working under a um, regulatory pause uh, because of the change in the, uh, the governor, the administration, and uh, the, the focus on the budget. Uh, it's been slow to get started. We had a bunch of discussions last fall. Uh, I think we are going to have a... a interim guidance document out there uh, in the near future. This says, if not already out by the time you read this. Well, guess what? It's not out yet. I had high hopes that it would be out before today. But it really is imminent. Uh, in the interim policy, basically is going to tell people that if you want to do one of these projects, you need to come to us for site-specific approval. Period. Uh, there's more detail than that in there, but that's the interim that I, I think will give us the – meet the deadline. Uh, and then this spring, we're going to pick up again with discussions about what the longer-term, more detailed approach will be. And that's where we would like you to get more involved. And because we know that it's hard to find stuff on our website, uh, we've also created this blog at www.reclamationsoil.org, uh, which – Gives you all of this material, uh, links to what other states are doing, links to videos of the meetings that we've held, uh, so you can follow along. We want this to be a very open process, and we want you to be involved. So if you send me an email, uh, ask me to put on our mailing list. I'll put you on the mailing list to get all the emails, but you can also just check reclamationsoil.org uh, anytime, and everything we do will be published there. <sighs> Anything else? Any questions?